As an American, I never thought that I could visit Mali. But here I am, a land where ancient secrets and untouched landscapes meet. Mali is a land of ancient rituals and hidden knowledge. Come with me as I have my fortune told, see incredible life like marionettes, and learn about history. Like some people even use black magic to hunt. Leave behind what you thought you knew, and join me to see Mali in a new light. Not what you've seen on the news, not what your State Department tells you. Come with me and open your mind. Let's go. Day one, Mali. The situation in Mali is ever-changing. Every region has a different situation. And while there are some rebels in the north, Bamako is extremely safe. What I didn't realize is that the south of Bamako is also very safe. Essentially, we could have taken public transport to go to the south, but I didn't know this. So we decided to hire a driver and a local day guide. Little did I know this guide would make our trip. Okay, we're starting off our first day and we're heading to Sibi. It's gonna be about a two hour drive. And it's starting to get very green. When I pictured Mali before, I pictured desert. And that is definitely what the north is. But the south of Bamako is incredibly green, especially because we are on the tail end of the rainy season. At this point, I'm unaware of Jibri's connection to the spirit world. I was also unaware that there is so many ties to the animist culture and religion, those who practice it, and those who simply have cultural ties. This cloak is used by the Mande people for hunting. As you can see, there are mirrors here. These mirrors are used so that they can potentially see the animals and make it easier to hunt. But do you see these squares? Black magic. I don't yeah. rub on the black, black magic. <laughs> Before colonizers came to West Africa, the Mande people lived with a set of constitutional rules. They inscribed this in the year 1236. Many of these people, as you can see, there are different castes of people here. They all have different roles in society. Interestingly enough, when animist religion was the only religion that was practiced here, they would go to the sorcerers and they would go to the people who practice black magic to ask them for help and to essentially cast spells for them. Obviously, a lot has changed, and this is now seen as jinn, but not by everybody. All right, we've spent enough time here. It's time to get back on the road, because we need to get to the village. Every Monday woman has a peanut farm. Not only is this a huge industry, but it is a huge food component. Did you know how peanuts grow? I never realized that they grow on these weed-type looking plants, and they have to be harvested from the ground. Good? Yeah. Good? I guess that peanut was actually really unripe, but he was smiling through it. Now we're going to have an African massage as we go up the hill to try and get to the village of Sibi. Okay, I haven't seen one of these in a long time. This is an ashtray for all of you Gen Z kids that have never seen an ashtray in a vehicle. We're about to hike up to the arch. Let's go. Please tell me why as soon as we started this hike, I immediately fell. Should we watch that again? Boom. Okay, let's get back on track. So as I mentioned, at this point, I had absolutely no idea that we were going to have our fortune told. I had no idea that Jibi was connected to the spirit world as he is. But we started to get some clues. I'll get to that in a few minutes though. This hike is to get to the Arc de Gamdajan. It's not a difficult hike, but it is very well known because the caves above are known to have spiritual powers. GP carries this gourd with him everywhere and he's picking up some water. I will offer some to my ancestral when we go to the cave. That will help because sometimes the ancestral need to drink. Again, I didn't think anything at this point. I just felt that he was being spiritual because he has such a great energy. All of a sudden, he began to sing. Oh, 
All of a sudden he stopped and we arrived to the mouth of a cave. Wow. Welcome to the cave. See some animal oh. inside. Basically, Jibre was warning me that there might be animals in the cave and I need to be careful. And although I felt pretty confident, I also got a little bit scared. So I got out of there pretty quickly. But this cave is so impressive. Do you see all of those lines and layers of history? Let's continue on because we actually need to get to the Ark. Now, I had absolutely no idea what to expect, but when I actually saw it, I was in awe. I understand why this is such a spiritual place. It is beautiful here. Not only is there an incredible view splayed out in front of you, but the arch is just so big and so impressive. Jibi now said it's time to give water to the ancestors. <laughs> As we're walking, all of a sudden, I started seeing kind of like red dots, and I thought that maybe it was fruit that had spilled. But I was told that these were from animal sacrifices. This is very common in the animist religion to sacrifice animals such as chickens specifically. You're not supposed to step on these areas, but they are specifically supposed to go on the road when someone wants to basically secure their journey and make them have a safe journey. Okay, but look at this cave. It is really just incredible and awe-inspiring. It really feels like it's something out of Indiana Jones. That's all I can really describe it as. I mean, look at this. It looks like a Raiders of the Lost Ark set. Or even something similar to the temples in Cambodia that are carved out at Angkor Wat. However, all of this is completely natural. Carved away by water dripping over and over and over again. Now let's explore the cave a little bit. This rock pile is often used for sacrifices, and sometimes people will place another rock on top of the rock pile when they're asking their god for something. Now at this point, I had no idea what Jibril was doing, but he decided to clear off this area. He had told us the story of the fox table before, letting us know that this is something that is done in Dogon country where he's from. After cleaning off the area, he went to grab some dirt from a random place in the cave. This is the process of setting up the fox table to call the ancestors. And thus he began to draw the fox table, making lines almost like a tic-tac-toe board, steadily, methodically, very much in concentration. So now he is making a brand new table for me to basically talk to the ancestors, read my future, tell me about what I'm wishing for. So I'm going to take sand and I'm going to put it on there and then he's going to get the ideas because we're in kind of a sacred place right now. At this point, I'm not really sure what to believe, but I'm here for the ride. There's several pieces of wood because our ancestral was uh, two, who, two human who create the world, men and women. The man in anime tribe, man has a uh, three, three cents and three opportunity. Then women have four. Is that why we need seven wood after making the fox table? The seven wood represent men and women who create the world. It is really nice to see a representation of women in some type of religion and being equal to or more than 
than the men. The fox table is drawn and I'm grabbing the dirt. At this point, I'm kind of freaking out in my head because I have no idea what I'm supposed to wish for. But as I threw the dirt, something came to my mind and I wished for the best. Let's see how this goes. I'm really not sure what to think right now. So at first the fox table said you are good healthy. I did wish partially for good health and I was kind of like, okay, we're starting off a little slow. Let's see where this goes. And there is a part of our family people who are thinking about you now because you are traveling far away from home. <laughs> This might seem basic to most people, but I definitely know that my mom was thinking about me because she always gets kind of stressed right when I leave. He's talking about your parents. I don't know his mom or father who are uh, thinking about you a lot now. Like I said, getting a little bit more eerie. See, there is your ancestral who need, uh, you need some offer from you. Yeah, something to drink. It can be a water or milk. When you get to to put somewhere in the ground who are dry. Okay. Yeah. Just a water bottle. He said you have a long life. I don't know why, but Dilara stopped filming. But he was saying that I am going to have a long life. And this is something that I really also believe. I also really hope, of course. Except sometimes also you have dream. Don't know if he's right or... Yes, it is right. I have a lot of dreams, and I always have. Sometimes you dream when you, you 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 sleep. I think we all dream, no? Yeah, but not often. <laughs> some people, some people have dream, but very uh, very less. I think. Can you see how I'm contemplating my life and just trying to avoid it being totally true? Okay, I just need to give in. Sometimes you always think about something was very difficult for you. You think a lot sometime about that. Not me staying up all night sometimes, stressing about conversations that I've had with friends. Is that anxiety or is it part of this prophecy? I don't know. And some white, uh, white collar nut and to sacrifice that. Okay. And when you do that, you will see very soon things will work very well. And also when the things start to be working, you have to find a milk and give to some people it can be in africa or even europe if you don't find the poor people you can even buy milk and say all your wish and give to someone who are close to you okay. now this is what i need to do for the prophecy to become true however i didn't record the most important part and he said i have a hater that doesn't want me to be famous he said it's someone close to me. He said it's someone that I wouldn't expect. And now maybe he's not really talking about fame. Maybe he's just talking about some type of notoriety, having followers, but he doesn't even know anything about my following. And believe me, I'm not saying I'm famous, but you know what I mean? Maybe things like that can be misconstrued. I don't know. Anyways, now it's time for Dilata's fortune to be told. Little bit, son. You can say what you want. Or you can live here and I can communicate. You have good health and and sometimes you think about too much about <laughs> life. We are laughing because Dilara is a chronic overthinker. Is that good? <laughs> Information about, about job. About what? About job. Now, I can't say too much, but at this point, he was talking about some work-related things for Dilara. Things have been in the works with this, so it made sense, but when we went back and checked the emails that she received at the time, it completely coincided with what he said. Maybe we'll update you on this in a little bit. Do you see that smile on her face? She is so freaking happy about this prophecy. And there, a lot of door will be open. Let's so, go and find milk now. And when you do, you will see very soon... There is a many opportunity and door will be open for you. All of a sudden his smile faded and he went back into hyper focus mode. Okay.
Going back down. And we are back on the road. Along the way, there are incredible views, like this waterfall just casually outside my window. Now we've just reached a village in Sibi. We are welcomed with some traditional Malian tea, and this is where we're going to be staying for the next few nights. This village is incredible. There's views of the arch right there, and it's just so beautiful and green all around. I'm just taking a quick peek because we're about to have lunch and it's looking good already. There's some music playing and Jibi is the life of the party as usual. <laughs> While we wait, we're trying some of these local peanuts. They actually call them ground nuts here. Sabani. There is three, three nuts inside. We call it Sabani. Sabani. Yes. But now it's time for lunch. These are the grounds of where we'll be staying and I'm just following her out to the table but it's so peaceful here, it's very serene, and I can't wait to eat. This is a salad dressing that we're having over the freshest vegetables. There's actually mustard in the dressing, which is a recipe that was brought over by the French a long time ago. Now look at these gorgeous vegetables. They are so sweet, so fresh, and this bread is very, very good. Homemade, of course. This is local couscous that grows here with a very pretty garnish on the top. And for the main course, we're having a tomato stew. This has a bunch of different vegetables in it, some oil, some red pepper there on the side. Can't wait to try the spice. There's also some potatoes and cabbage in here. It's actually very healthy. After a tasty lunch, it's time to explore where we will be staying tonight. It's super clean and it's very insulated, so it's not super hot in here, even though it's definitely pretty hot outside. It's made from brick. There's two beds in here actually, and a very comfortable mattress. There's also a mosquito net on the top that we'll put down a little bit later. I thought the piece of art was a very cute touch. And we're definitely gonna need that fan. Now I'm extremely excited because there is a mask dance performance going on today. As you can see, all of the children of the village have gathered there, and the first mask dancer starts to come out. <laughs> come out as well. They're coming in as a procession, and the dance itself starts out slowly too. They come and they tease the audience members, they try to kind of scare the children. See the man behind the monkey? He's there to help guide the monkey, because they can't see that well with the masks on. Each mask has a special symbolization. The chimpanzees show the connection between humans and monkeys, and Jibi's just there because he wanted to join in. Suddenly, things started to speed up. <laughs> came in from the side. This one looked like a sheep and is known as the mother of the mask. They make the beer from mullet. The kids seemed to be enjoying it, except there was one little kid who got scared and started crying. And then all of the mask dancers were dancing at once. This big faced dancer is the father of the mask. <laughs> The kids seemed really into it, and they were having fun even though they look a little bit bored. This smaller face dancer is the mask of circumcision and teaching the mask dance and how to do the initiation into the religion. All of a sudden, they began to have a face-off. This was very cool to watch. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
dancers came up and started giving high fives to all of the kids and they were very involved. I love that this dance incorporates community so much. And then of course, it was time to incorporate us. I was trying so hard to copy the exact movements and of course I look absolutely ridiculous, but now it's time for Dilata's turn. <laughs> After an incredible performance, we decompressed, took a photo, and I think it's time to explore the rest of the village. Now, I'd like to make it very clear that typically a mask dance is done when an elder passes away to help the spirit be taken out of the village, or after the rainy season, they celebrate Ama, their god. So we specifically paid to be able to see this performance. The money goes to the performers and the village, and I felt like it was money well spent, but do not expect to come to West Africa and just casually see a mask dance any day of the week. This is something that we requested to see in advance because I really wanted to experience this part of Malian culture that I've never seen in West Africa before. Sibi is an area of Mali that has 21 villages and a total population of a little bit under 30,000 people but we are only exploring one of those villages today. There are a lot of goats, as this is one of the main food sources for people in Sibi. Goat, chicken, lamb, sheep, as well as the various fruits and vegetables that are grown here. In this village, the houses are painted, and this is called Bogotja. The different symbols mean different things. So all those have meaning also. They represent family. Some represent uh, the member of family. Some represent how is uh, how many home wife the man has it they have all this meaning on the family this represent family so cousin brother and sister sometimes when you see this on the family this is a message to tell people there is a 12 people or 20 people on the family because here people use to live to with big family brother and his wife, small brother with his wife. This is the kitchen and this here down here is actually a spiritual stone. This is all crops. There's a lot of tomatoes there and a lot of it was actually put in by a German company that came to kind of bring aid. Now while continuing to walk through the village, all of a sudden I see this dog. Apparently his name is Tarzan. It's supposed to be like Tarzan. Anyway, he was super cute and friendly. This blue contraption actually helps to take the peanuts and separate them from the shell. Peanuts are a huge industry in this part of Mali. Which brings me to our next destination, which is actually a co-op where they make shea butter and peanut butter. It is 37 women who work here, and this is the first step. The peanuts are roasted over the fire and then it's removed. After the peanuts have been roasted, the women then need to separate the peanuts from the little membrane on the outside. This is actually pretty tedious work. This is done by flipping the peanuts up and up in the air. This separates them from the membrane, and then they're separated into two separate piles. But in order to make peanut butter, they need to be put into this machine. Now this machine is definitely very old, and it scared me a little bit. It took quite a while to get it started, and it definitely seemed really dangerous. <laughs> These are the instructions on how to make things in the local language. And this is the factory. Those are the women sitting outside who are taking the peanuts from the membrane. And in this area over here is the shea butter factory, which I could smell the scent of. But let's get back to the peanut butter. He finally was able to get that belt on, which like I said, looked really dangerous because he had to do it while the machine was still moving. And then he began pushing the peanuts into the machine. Wow, this was super impressive because look how fast the peanut butter comes out.
They sell this tub of peanut butter for 12 US dollars, which yes, it does seem very low, but that is just the price that it is here. Imagine how much this would sell in the United States for, probably $50 maybe. They do export peanut butter, but I don't think to the United States. These are all of the shea butter products and we definitely got some soap because shea butter soap is amazing and so hydrating. Now I wanted to show these different grain storages here because if you can remember in Niger, I learned a lot about different types of grain storage. Here are two different versions. They're mainly made with clay on the outside, but I thought it was cool to see how they store grains here and it is a bit similar to Niger. One of the last people that I am meeting on my little trip through the village is this weapons maker, so he makes different weapons. If you can see, it's kind of a slingshot, but they call it a village gun. Anyway, night has fallen and now it is time to make dinner. We will be making dinner with a few of the women that live here, and I'm really excited to learn how to make a specific dish that is made from peanuts and peanut butter. We're gonna learn how to make peanut sauce. I've only had Asian peanut sauce, I've never had African peanut sauce, so I'm really excited to try this. So first, we have these coals to cook with, and we're going to take hot coals and put them on those coals in order to make them burn so we can actually use them. This family has charcoal, but it's not incredibly common in all of the villages here in Mali. So we're actually lucky that we have this because it is going to make cooking a lot faster. Peanuts. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. So that peanut butter that we saw today is in here and we're adding water and then we are just cooking it down for a while. One thing that we noticed while we were cooking is that the women have babies on them. They're reaching over the fire and everybody's totally fine. But in the US, parents are so overprotective of their children a lot of times, but these women are just fearless. It's so impressive. How many pieces? Like small? Yeah, you can do as small as you can. As small as I can? Mm -hmm. I heard in a bowl here, but I'm doing my best. So as you can see, now we're still just boiling and making sure that everything is disintegrating properly inside. And finally, someone gave me a cutting board. Much better. This is the setup. It's actually very comfortable. It's more comfortable than when I'm at home. I'm loving it. This is the cycle that we're doing with everything. I'm chopping it and then putting it inside the boiling water. Everyone is telling me how many spices to put in. Huh? Oh. Uh. Oh. Two. Oh. One. 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 Only one. Only one. Hey, 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 you know this? Carrot and uh, cabbage. Cab cabbage, yeah. <laughs> this really embodies what the night was about, just laughing and having a good time. And now we mix it all together and we let it simmer. Sumbala. Sumbala? Yeah, Sumbala is from Nere, your <laughs> Like that? What is it? I don't know, it smells like Sumbala. Sumbala is uh, from Nere. This is spicy. The sheet. The sheet of Nere is dry and we found it. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> I don't recommend eating it this way. <laughs> yeah, when you... It's very healthy. <laughs> very healthy. <laughs> I was expecting something. Oh, that's good. Lamaga. Lamaga. Faster, faster. Lamaga faster, man. Lamaga mean bigger. Mix it. Mix it. Yeah. Nice. Not so Ready. Now because quite literally everybody is watching my every move. I'm really trying not to mess it up. I'm doing things slowly and meticulously. Okay, we've now taken off the peanut sauce, putting the rice on there. <laughs> this is a mix of garlic and peppers, and it smells so, so good. I mean, that's all? Yeah, all. You put all. 
And just like we've made our rice and we've made our peanut butter curry, which is called tikka dege. This is such a tasty meal. It ended up taking us about two hours. Dinner was great. Now we gotta do a bucket shower and get to bed because we have to wake up early, of course. Good morning. We just woke up here. Let's greet the day. We're starting off preparing our breakfast over this little stove. This is the bread. It's the same homemade bread from yesterday and it's so yummy. I can't wait to taste this. I thought it would be fun to fly the drone just so we could get a little bit of a look of what is around us here. Having some corn porridge. I guess this is a very typical breakfast here in Mali. It's good. And it's very filling and the corn is also local so I was happy to try it. But this is how you're actually supposed to eat it using the spoon that's made from kalabash or pumpkin. So we're heading out on the open road. <laughs> there are some women who are selling some fruits and some vegetables so we're buying some as we drive by. This is actually melon. If you can remember the mask dance that we just saw, those masks are very popular for people to hang in their homes and all have symbols. So we are heading to where those masks originate. This is a mask factory of sorts. Those white ones will be painted with colors and they actually export a lot of these masks. Many of them are sold to South Africa specifically. And what I find interesting is that in South Africa, these are sold to tourists and to anybody who will buy them, but they're marketed as South African masks when in reality, South African culture doesn't necessarily have masks. So that's something to keep in mind when you see masks, that they may just originate in Mali or another West African country, where masks are actually a big part of the culture. But I'm super excited to be here because I really wanted to get something to remember my time in Mali. These masks are incredible. I love all the colors. I love all the different symbolisms and meanings and shapes. It's going to be really, really hard to pick something from all of these different options. That's the one thing about traveling is that you see so many cool things and beautiful artwork, but you can't take everything home. I mean, look at this mask. Look at the creativity and the craftsmanship. It's just beautiful. And who would have thought that most of the masks that you see on the side of the road being sold or at different markets actually come from this little workshop right here. So like I said, it's pretty hard to choose something. I do love these colorful masks. However, I don't really think that it will look very good in my house just because we do have kind of a central theme of blue turquoise in the home and then wood. Then we came across this and I thought the meaning was really nice. Kanaga. Mm, Kanaga. Yeah, represent two hands praying for Amma to have rain or good luck and the two harvests. I also feel like the craftsmanship with the copper on top of these cow masks are really interesting. This is where the masks originate and we came to a price that everybody agreed on. We paid $50 for both of these. GB said that this is still technically a tourist price, but it's okay. I think it was a fair price for us to pay. Today we are visiting a very interesting village in Kulikoru. Islam is one of the main religions in Mali today but not everybody practices Islam as serious as the people we are visiting. The floors are draped with cow skins, but we're actually inside of a cave, and this is considered to be a mosque. It looks as though it's perfect to be a mosque. The ceiling is beautiful, and to the left over here are all of the tablets that the children learn to write Quran on. One thing that I was thinking about while we're here is that the people living here are living a completely different life from the people that we stayed with last night. And I think it's incredible how diverse Mali is. And to be honest, we're only scratching the surface. Okay, now it's time to get to lunch. This is tikka dege. It's the peanut butter curry, like the same as last night. But we also have a tomato stew and then we have potato leaves. I didn't even know that you could eat these but they look really good. Now, technically we are still in the rainy season, although it is the end of the rainy season, it's still happening, so it's starting to drizzle a little bit. Alright, 
and on another episode of A Day in Mali. Wait, actually, we're still in the same episode because everyone requested I do one long video. So this could have been the second or the third video, but instead, we're here in the same video, and I hope you're still watching. This is Compagnie Nama. It is a really cool organization that is based in the arts. See this pretty cool sculpture that they made out of old car parts? But they do more than just make sculptures like this. This is a marionette workshop. Now, when I first heard of marionettes, I was like, oh, that's kind of boring. But these marionettes are very different from the other ones that I've seen before. So we're getting an inside look on how they make the marionettes and what they do with them. Essentially, it is an after-school activity so kids can join, but if they come and live here, they don't have to pay for it. And then they can travel around the world and showcase the dancing. I thought that these were going to be a totally different type of marionette, and I am super impressed. These are so cool. Now, there are a ton of different marionettes here. I mean, look at the variety. There are the big heads, there are the skinny ones, but nothing could have prepared me for how they actually wear them and how they do the dance. It was almost a little scary because it's so lifelike, but obviously not at the same time. These marionettes were kind of born out of the idea of the mask dance. They also create those costumes here as well, but these marionettes are basically a modern version of that that allow people to express themselves creatively. I thought the creativity with this one was absolutely amazing. I mean, look how lifelike the face is. The attention to detail is just incredible. It was really cool to visit here, and I'm so glad that this place exists because it's definitely a haven for children and an amazing creative outlet. Now I want to use this time to talk about the conflicts going on in other parts of the country, such as Timbuktu. This man is from Timbuktu. He is very well known for his calligraphy of specific Quran verses and holding original pages of the manuscript. But like I said, I want to take this time to talk about what's going on in other parts of the country. Timbuktu is northeast of Bamako. Timbuktu is known for having been the historical center of Islamic culture, trade, and learning. It's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1988 because of the mud mosques. However, it was put on the UNESCO World Heritage Sites in danger in 2012. There are three main mud mosques here that were built in the 15th and 16th centuries. For now, attacks are common in Timbuktu, especially for foreigners. There is a risk of kidnapping. I have recently found out that I may be able to go in the near future, but it is incredibly expensive to go, and it didn't seem worth it for me to go with a large group and pay $2,000 for one day. I just don't really understand that type of travel. I'd rather go when it's one, more affordable, and two, not as dangerous. But for now, we'll get our history of Timbuktu and all of the information about what he does with his calligraphy from Muhammad. And I hope someday we'll all make it to Timbuktu. Where does cement come from? It comes from sand. And today I'm learning about the sand harvesters of Mali, but right from the source. As you can see, the men put the sand on the trucks. There are people who work 24 hours per day here. And I don't mean that one person works 24 hours, but there are people that are here 24 hours per day working. Basically, they have this caravan of boats and they are all tied to one another and all 20 of the boats. And then all the women will take all of the sand off of the boats. One man takes all of the sand into the boats. Then 12 women take the sand from the boat and bring it off of the boat. They try to do seven boats per day, getting 1,000 sefa per boat, approximately $1.66, which means they can get maximum $11 per day. Many women bring their children with them, either strapped to their bodies or just sitting here alone. Different types of sand yield different prices, and this is based on how they utilize the sand. This, this is strong. Uh, this one and this one is not the same. Come, I will show Let's follow him to see the other type of sand, because for me, they all look the same. This is not strong. Oh. Maybe this one is strong. This one is not strong. So the other one's more expensive? Yes, it's very expensive. <laughs> this one. They told us the stronger one is actually cheaper and the thinner one is more expensive because that's used to build the outside and it's the construction, the main one, and this one is for like small details, he said. Now these trucks come and purchase the sand. The sand that is purchased here near the water is cheaper. At about 125,000 sefa, this truck commands about $200, while the sand in town is more expensive at about $260 per truckload. These are generally Malian owned, but anybody can come here and start a business in the sand industry. Conditions are harsh and the boats need to be repaired often. If you can see here, this is a man who is repairing one of the boats. 
The repairs are done by boiling tar, which is very toxic to breathe in. It can also be very dangerous and people can get burnt. It's then placed on the areas that are flooding on the boats. These repairs must be done often. All of a sudden, a few men came up to us. They were looking at the camera and they were asking me how much the camera cost, but they were in awe at the camera. To be honest, I felt a little bit embarrassed at the cost of the camera considering how much people are making here. Now, to fully understand the process, we are going to go on this boat here and we are going to see everything from the water. At first, I felt like this was fun. We got to go on the water and it was nice to see everything, but then the reality set in. These boats are used to transport people who have to work long hours. This is not a fun activity, and this is a very laborious and intensive industry that people are thrown into. And then something else began to happen. We realized that the boat was somewhat flooding. Jibril said that this was normal and that people just had to take all the water out by using a scooper like this. So they transport tons of sand through these boats that people sit on top of the sand while it floods. Does that not sound like some sort of hell? Moments like this really put things in perspective. Life is hard for so many people around the world. People who make such little money for very laborious efforts. But these people do some of the most important jobs in the world. Harvesting sand means that we can build buildings. Without these people, there would be no buildings. And that is the harsh reality. In some countries, sand harvesting has become even sort of a mafia activity, specifically because a lot of the countries around Singapore and the UAE have actually banned selling sand to them. So these mafias have been created because they need sand in order to build the extremely large buildings that they build. Just another thing in the world that we have to put in perspective. Now, if you can see these settlements here, these are actually underwater right now, but in other seasons, people come here and they live here. They come from places like Dogon and other parts of the country to work and make money. Again, it is tough work, but it is hard to find jobs that pay as much as these jobs do. Now, not only is it starting to rain, but it's starting to get dark as well, so it's time to get off the boat and head back to the shore. Now, I saw this woman out of the corner of my eye, and she was running with the sand on her head. Now, I'm just walking on a very similar plank here, and it's even difficult just walking. And then something happened. Going to attempt to carry sand. Let's see if I can do this. This stemmed from some of the women coming up to me and jokingly playing around that they were going to throw sand on me. And then they asked, do you want to try? And I actually felt like this was a really good opportunity kind of just to put myself in their shoes and see how it feels to be carrying the sand. I also felt kind of bad because I felt like I was in their way and they were literally running with the sand on their head. So I wanted to move quick. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. Okay, come. Come. If I'm being completely honest, as I was doing this, the guy who owns this area or is the leader of this area was cheering me on. And I saw women with babies strapped to their backs working. And although I know they kind of egged me on to do this in the first place, I felt so weird about the fact that they were working so hard with babies strapped on their back and this guy was cheering me on just for carrying one barrel on my head. So honestly, this made me feel kind of embarrassed because these women do such a difficult job day in and day out. They are truly super women and they're doing what they have to for their families. It was then time to leave and I saw a gas station. I always love to compare gas station prices. At 850 sefa per liter, this ends up being about $2.47 per gallon. This might not seem like a lot to you, but in comparison to the economy, this is very expensive. Having said that, we also needed to grab some cash of our own before we headed to dinner. Because of the French colonization, there are a lot of French-based restaurants, and we didn't really pick this restaurant. But GB was friends with the people that work here, so we said sure, and they hung out with their friends while we ate. We had some salad, and some plantains, and some french fries, so this was a pretty good meal, although it's not very Malian. Okay, we're in Bamako. Let's go explore the city. First coffee. The first coffee. Many people consider Bamako to be a dangerous city because, for many people, Mali is a dangerous country. Now, while there is a lot of fighting in other parts of the country, Bamako is not inherently a dangerous city. So today, we're here out without a guide and we're going to explore. Right off the bat, because there are not a lot of foreigners that walk around here by themselves, kids are naturally curious and a lot of people are not In general, this just makes me feel like definitely safe. Thank you. 
I also thought it was really cool that there are lots of women on motorbikes riding by themselves. This isn't something that you see in every single country. Okay, but our goal now is to get to the coffee shop. And we made it! It's always nice to find some good espresso and enjoy this before we start the day. Okay, there happen to be a lot of Lebanese restaurants in many African countries, so we definitely got some good salad too. And now our goal is to get to the market. We're trying to get to the Grand Marché, which is one of the largest markets in Bamako. And we're taking public transportation to get there. These green buses are called Somtramas. Grand Marché. Grand Marché. Uh, how much? Four and uh, yeah. Huh? For both. I said this after and this after. I always say that before you go to West Africa, you should learn some French, and I really don't know much French. So I didn't take my own advice, but it would have definitely been helpful right here. This song. Three? Four. Four. Ah. Two, two. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Now I found out that apparently these guys who run these buses are notorious for being under the influence of some sort, but they were super friendly and very talkative. So this entire ride was a really great time. They gave us a little bit of insight, the best that we could communicate in English and a little bit of French, especially because I thought it was very curious that they had the American flag right here displayed in the dash. Okay, now we've made it to the Grand Marche and they told us that it's our time to get out. Okay, Immediately we're met by sights and sounds. Everything is essentially chaos, but also working together at the same time. This is very common of a West African market. You can find anything and everything here. That is why I love to visit. For example, this woman getting her eyebrows done casually here, right next to where you can buy some clothing. It really shows you a window into a city. We first walked up to this woman who was selling peanuts, and we basically had to understand which ones were roasted and which ones were raw. These kind of look like ginger, and I'm not exactly sure what they are. We'll try them later. I saw this woman selling guava, and I definitely have to get some of that. I know some people struggle with going to markets because they feel like there are people that are trying to get them to buy different things at all times, but this is just part of going to a market. For example. <laughs> Here you can see henna and indigo dye being sold. Now we wanted to leave again by Somtrama, but this is a little bit different because our destination is not somewhere that we can fully describe. Luckily, this guy across from us was super helpful, and he ended up trying to get us to follow him so that he could show us where to go. I always say that 50% of traveling solo is relying on the kindness of strangers. And now we're just casually walking through a neighborhood where there happened to be a lot of women and families. Although we have a 20 minute walk, this ended up being really great because we could chat with some of the people and it ended up being a really great experience. Today is my last day in Mali. We're visiting Jibi's workshop. We need more sun because after the design we need to dry the, the stuff. He works with both new and recycled cotton to make sustainable clothing. These are some of the cotton before they're stripped of their color, but they also use mud and bleach to dye and create designs. Let's learn about it. After uh, collecting we keep like two days 
when the mats start to smell, that means it's good for design. This is a local shop. We use the local shop to make design. So here you can see that bleach is being used to dye on the black colored clothing. All of the symbols that you will see mean something. Many of them are extremely old and have been used for thousands of years. This is the place the people make a, the, when they take shower with traditional medicine. After shower, the leaves of the medicine, they go to put the... Because we, we live in Africa, the gin, the meat and, and the crossing road, you know, the gin, the devil, is there the meat and when you bring the, uh, after taking shower of the medicine, when you leave the leaves there, and there is some spiritual come on, snack, snack way, someone who don't want to pay his debt. Like you borrow money from someone, you this you saw this person are coming and you make like this, you go to the other other road. And this talk about uh, wedding. A big family. They knew when you get married, you know when you go to Han Moon, Han Moon. You know, we make plate like this and we, we eat there. Yeah. I thought it was really incredible that they're going to paint over this with the mud. But those designs will still show through and they have all of these processes to preserve the designs, but also to create them in a very specific way. And they've been using these methods for so long. I also love that they try to be extremely sustainable here and also give jobs to young people so that they can learn this craft. The meaning of this together is the best. So if that didn't make full sense, this symbol essentially means that being together is the best. I saw this one and I thought it was just incredible. I loved all the different colors. It's crazy that they're able to make this. Amelie, okay. When you use those color, it's not like, a, as I told you, this is like snake oil, someone who don't want Not everyone starts at such a high level though. Some of the younger boys and girls start off just by tracing. For example, here you can see he's tracing Che Guevara, which is seen as a symbol of resistance. And this one is not as polished as some of the others, but that's how you learn. This is what they'll look like once all of the different dye patterns have been put on and then all of the contrasting and highlighting colors as well. Again, it's so crazy that this is all made from natural substances. But let's go back and let's learn about how it goes from this, how the color gets put on here, and how sustainable the whole process is. In Galama, we use also for uh, malaria when people are sick. We drink three days and that will clean your blood. You see the way we use it? We put here and we pound it to make powder. And this is what they use to dye the yellow fabrics. See the way? Then when we pound it, see we put to the box after uh, 30 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes, the water will start to come, start to become blue. <laughs> Some people make uh, with the fire. They specifically choose not to use fire because they want to be more sustainable and they feel like putting smoke into the environment is not sustainable, as well as using coal or wood. We have a big rouleau, like a 500 meter, we catch them and by machine we make uh, them together. And this is the first process. We just put to the ngalama and dry it. And when it's dry, we'll put again. Because to get a, a, a strong yellow, we have to put like two times, sometimes three times. Then after that, we make our design. The reason, the fruit is very sweet. 
and those are the bark of resin that give also you know the color marron you see the brown Instead of using artificial dyes, they're using everything from nature. So this creates the maroon or the dark brown color. The dirt from the Niger River is what makes the very dark brown color that they use to dye things and make designs, and the Ngalama makes the yellow color. But it doesn't stop there. They have white designs, blue designs from indigo, and all of the other designs in these colors that look like this. Now, I haven't been able to figure this out, but I would love to help bring this to the rest of the world. Shipping and different things like that are a problem, so I would have to physically go to Mali. But if people were seriously interested in this, I might be able to do special orders. I'm not promising anything, and I'm not 100%, but let me know in the comments if this is something you might be interested in. Thank you for watching this video about Mali. This country is filled with so much wonder and beauty. I have barely scratched the surface. I hope to return using my five-year visa and visit Timbuktu and many other parts of the country. And maybe this will inspire some of you adventurers to go to Mali. Because although people are struggling and there are dangers within this country, there is so much positivity and so much to discover. Thank you, Mali. Thank you to Jibril specifically. He really made this trip special and beautiful. Let me know any questions you have in the comments. And I can't wait to see you in the next video.